welcome back to the theory seminar. Uh, our speaker this week is Eden. Eden is an assistant professor at Ben Gurion University in Israel. Uh, he is currently on sabbatical at TTIC. He received his PhD in 2009 from Princeton University. Uh, his research focuses mainly on approximation algorithms. His work appeared in many top tier theory conferences such as Stock, Folk, Soda, iCalc, etc. And Eden, we are glad to have you here today. Um, over to you. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. Thank you for, for inviting me to uh, give this talk. Um, so uh, I should say first that uh, this is joint work that I've done here with uh, uh, people here at uh, TTIC with uh, Yuri Mikalichev and Ali Bekilian. Uh, who's a postdoc here. And uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about cascaded norms in clustering. Uh, at least this is the, the title that I had uh, sort of in mind uh, initially, but then I thought, you know, maybe I should be a little bit more specific. So I also added uh, how I learned to stop worrying and love approximation algorithms using nonlinear convex programs with rounding based separation oracles. Um, so hopefully you're, you're all still here and I'm don't worry, I'll explain what all of these things uh, mean, at least to, to some extent. Okay, um, so let, let me start right off and, and sort of talk a little bit about clustering. I should say I, I did sort of prepare these slides originally for a sort of a somewhat wider audience. So, you know, if, if things kind of drag a little, you can tell me just kind of skip ahead. Everyone knows it's okay. Um, okay, so clustering, uh, right, is, is sort of a a sort of general uh, task, basically, right, you're given some collection of data points or objects, uh, there's some similarity or dissimilarity measure between them, actually a distance function, and what we want to do is cluster or group them together by, you know, their, their distance. So we want to cluster, uh, uh, you know, points that are close together into, into individual clusters. So, uh, okay, here's an example, uh, right? So here there's uh, this uh, sort of a collection of, uh, of data points and we can kind of map them in two dimensions and sort of the sort of salient dimensions that I thought were relevant here was you know, one is the number of ears minus the number of eyes and the other one is sort of the, the range of you know, to what extent the, the objects and the data points have tried to kill me in the past. Um, and sort of, you know, using this mapping uh, you know, a natural clustering into two clusters might be this. Uh, so I don't know if this is ne necessarily the clustering that you would come up with, but like I said, they do approximation algorithms. So I don't promise that this is an optimal solution. Um, okay, so so a little bit more uh, formally, right? Uh, so a clustering problem, uh, we're given a finite uh, set of points and we're given some distance, distance function. Notice that, you know, although I only have two dimensions on my screen. This should not think of it as necessarily a Euclidean uh, metric, right? This could be any uh, metric over a finite point set where the metric is explicitly given. Uh, and then we have this K, this number of clusters that uh, we want to cluster the data into. Uh, and sort of the basic task uh, in at least this sort of centroid model with, uh, you know, arbitrary uh, distance functions or metrics is uh, that we want to choose K centers from the point set, right? So if this was Euclidean, you might think of, it, okay, maybe you want to choose a point that's not in the input, but here all we have is this finite point set. So we want to choose K centers from among those points. Uh, we want to assign uh, after doing that, we assign every point to uh, the nearest center from the collection of centers that we chose. Uh, and then we have some objective, right? So we want to minimize some, some function, uh, some measure of how good this clustering is. So some very common, uh, okay, so sorry. So here's a, an example, right? So we chose these three uh, centers and then every point is assigned to the nearest one. Um, so some very common minimization uh, objectives may be, for example, k-median, where uh, what we are minimizing is the sum of distances to their nearest centers. So in this example, if k equals 2, then you would get uh, this clustering. And there's also k-center, where we are uh, want, to, we want to minimize the maximum over the distances of all the various points to their closest centers. So again, it's the same example you would get this clustering and another popular one is k-means 
uh, where uh, the measure is actually summing the squares of the distances from points to their nearest centers. And then can we get, you know, if we were optimizing that, we would get some other uh, clustering. And notice that, you know, these definitions are a little bit different, but they can all be sort of phrased in, in the same framework. Uh, if you think about the, right, you choose the centers and then you look at the distance of every point to its nearest center, you get this vector of distances. Um, and these objectives are simply, uh, you know, uh, various LP metrics uh, or LP objectives, right? So this is like, the first one is the L1 objective, and the second one is the L infinity objective, the maximum overall coordinates. And this, the last one is the L2 objective, which well, it's the L2 objective squared, but it's, it's optimizing the same, it's the same function. Uh, okay, uh, good. So like I said, right, we're not solving these problems because they're NP hard, uh, right? And so the idea is that, you know, we, we focus on approximation algorithms, so we want to get uh, a, a, uh, a clustering, we want to choose some set of centers and, and cluster according to them, and we want the cost to be not too much worse than opt by some measure. So again, excuse me if this is a narrower audience that I initially made this talk for, but uh, just so we're on the same page, an alpha approximation algorithm uh, means here that we find in polynomial time some clustering, and the cost of the clustering, according to whatever measure we're trying to optimize, is at most alpha times the cost of the best possible uh, clustering, and that we can prove this fact uh, about the algorithm. Um, so for these various uh, problems that I uh, uh, just showed on, on the previous slide, right, we have some known approximations and hardness uh, of approximation results. Um, so they all admit some constant uh, approximation factor. I, I showed, I'm showing two different approximation factors for k-median, even though the, the earlier one was uh, not the best one, because uh, actually this this Sharikar Guha uh algorithm is, is sort of, uh, we'll be using, uh, or we, we have, we use some of the, uh, their machinery in our algorithm. So this is why I also mentioned them. Um, so all of these problems have uh, constant factor approximations and they all, all also have, you know, they, they're all also APX hard. So they have constant factor hardness as well. And in fact, for K-Center, it's very easy. And so it's kind of maybe the first hardness result that you see that, you know, in fact, the two approximation for K-Center is optimal. Uh, okay, but actually, uh, what I want to talk uh, about uh, today is not these uh, uh, sort of general problems, but more specifically the notion of fairness uh, in clustering. So, uh, right, when we think about uh, uh, clustering, right, we're sort of, in these problems that I described, we're optimizing some global objective, but of course, if, you know, if you have already built into the data, uh, you know, some, some, uh, you know, if, if, if the data itself is, is sort of masking some, some underlying, uh, you know, disadvantages and, and, you know, unfairness, then this will also, you know, appear in, uh, in, in the, in the algorithm if, if, uh, you sort of apply it naively. So, you know, uh, specifically if we're thinking about clustering, then, you know, it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be or, or you know, even even an optimum clustering is not necessarily fair, right? So if you just think, of, for example, you know, if you want to cluster, you know, the sort of uh, if you have to open, you know, vaccination sites and give people access to vaccination sites, you know, a global clustering may, for example, you know, be very suboptimal for isolated communities to to get to. Um, and so we sort of want to mitigate that kind of effect. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, right, so for example, here we have this, uh, this instance and think about these two, you know, possibly uh, disadvantaged groups uh, uh, that we are denoted by the, the brown and green uh, 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 diamonds, um, right? So, uh, right, so, so in this model, uh, uh, what we're, or you know, we didn't introduce this notion, but the notion of p-fair clustering, 
uh, here it defines not only the uh, sort of input that I talked about before with the, the, the distance function and the, the number target number of clusters, but also we have these groups which are subsets of the points that you know are marginalized groups that we want to sort of make sure are being treated fairly. Um, and the way that we measure that is by sort of looking at every group. Uh, and for each of these groups, we want to look at just the LP cost of the distances of the points or individuals in this group and, sort of, and, and, and apply min-max objectives. So sort of minimize the worst case cost over all these groups, right? So in this example, right, we have this brown group and this green group, and they each, you know, after clustering or after choosing some set of centers, they each incur some kind of cost. And we want to make sure that the maximum of these costs uh, is minimized. And in this picture, the groups are non-overlapping, but in general, they, they can be overlapping and they can also be weighted and all sorts of fun things. Uh, okay, right. So just to like, put this also in uh, concretely, uh, right, so we want to choose K centers. And what we are minimizing is the maximum overall group costs, where a group cost, a group cost is the uh, p norm applied to the vector of distances of points in the group to their closest centers. Um, so if this is sort of one of the fundamental definitions. Is, is there any questions so far about you know, what this uh, p fair clustering uh, is? Um, Okay, so if it's okay, then uh, um, so let's let's move on. So so what do we know about this problem in terms of uh, approximation algorithms? Um, so th this was actually uh, there's a nice recent paper by you know, my co-authors on, on on this result that I'm describing today, uh, where they show that this problem uh, has not a constant approximation like the problems that I discussed before, but a uh, a, a, a some uh, logarithmic approximation with some dependence on, on this uh, parameter p. Uh, and actually, this, this sort of you know, slightly strange expression turns out to be optimal. So it, actually, there's uh, a previous result uh, showing that, in fact, there is no better uh, approximation for this problem uh, unless you think that you know, NP possibly admits sub, uh, sub exponential time algorithms. All right, so right, so that's very nice, and the problem is solved, and that concludes my talk. I thank you for your time. Uh, no, sorry, actually, there's there's more, so you should still stick around. Um, okay, so so but this problem is uh, basically solved. Right? So it's, uh, there is a um, right, so there there is an optimal you know approximation known for this uh, problem, and. Uh, but you know we could kind of look at this problem a little bit more carefully, right? So again, uh, we have these various groups, and each one incurs some kind of cost. And we want to minimize the maximum over all the group costs. But then you can say, you know, why why maximum, right? Why is maximum the right notion of fairness, you know, except for all the perfectly good reasons why maximum is the right notion of fairness? So you know, could ask. You know, can we sort of generalize this notion of fairness? And and in generalizing it, I'm sort of thinking of, you know, sort of balancing between these two goals, right? The goal of uh, uh, the goal of of sort of getting a good uh, uh, global cost, and also the goal of being fair, uh, right? So, so if you think of it as kind of like a continuum, uh, where you know, at, at one extreme you have you know this completely fair notion where you want to you know, be uh, right you want the worst cost over all the groups to be minimized and the other one where you don't care about the groups at all you just want a good global cost um, and so the idea is to try and sort of uh, in interpolate between these two extremes in a nice smooth way uh, right um, so something that you know, may balance fairness and global cost. Uh, and the way that you know we've done this is is to sort of uh, extend this definition of p-fair clustering uh, with with another parameter. Um, so if here on the on this slide you have the definition of p-fair clustering, where uh, we have these groups and each group incurs a cost, uh, which is its uh, the 
uh, LP cost of its distance vector. Um, and we were the, the global objective was the maximum over all these costs. Then this more general notion of PQ fair clustering. And so we still have these group costs, but now instead of just taking the maximum, which is like the L infinity norm of these, uh, of, of this vector of group costs, uh, we can replace it with the LQ norm. So we can sort of have a, a you know, something in between completely ignoring the individual needs of the groups and just taking the worst case, uh, right? So if you think about it on a continuum, right? So at one end you have Q equals P and then the groups have no meaning and it's just optimizing the global cost. And at the other end you have Q equals infinity, which is, is the, the maximum overall group costs. And then if you sort of play with Q and take it to be, you know, somewhere between P and infinity, according to how much you want to weigh each of these objectives, then you get this kind of soft maximum or this sort of balancing between these two, these two different goals. Um, okay, so this is, this is actually, this is the problem that we've studied and that we're approximating. So, um, right, so and, any questions about this uh, so far? Okay, um, so, uh, okay, ex, ex, I, I, I don't know if you hear my dog whining in the background, so excuse me if you do. Um, all right, so, 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 uh, okay, so what have we done for this, uh, for this problem? Um, so what we have is a general approximation algorithm, which really works for any Q, uh, right, any, any parameterization of P and Q of uh, this form. Uh, and uh, before I just you know, splash a nice formula on the screen, so let me tell you sort of you know, some properties. So for one thing, if P and Q are constant, then we get a constant approximation, just like, you know, just like in the case of your global uh, optimization, uh, uh, right, uh, glo global cost objectives like we saw for k-means, etc. Uh, a constant approximation, which is independent of the input size, which is nice. And at the other extreme, where we have uh, p fair clustering, right? So that was with the, the global cost was sort of the maximum of all group costs. Uh, then we actually get the exact same approximation as Makarichev and Bakilian, that, that same optimal approximation factor for, for that problem. Uh, and if you sort of uh, as a as a general function of p and q, it's it's this formula here, which you don't stare at it for too long. But you know, if you've already started to stare at it a little bit, and you're wondering how this gives anything finite when q equals infinity, uh, which is what I'm claiming that it's that same sub uh, logarithmic approximation, then I should just point out that the l infinity and l log n. Uh, uh, norms are equivalent up to a constant. So you can, instead of plugging in Q equals infinity, you could plug in Q equals log N. And okay, I don't have that slide here, but uh, maybe they can, oops. Uh, okay, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, this is probably a bad idea. Okay, so here, right. So in the middle of the screen here, you see the right the, the approximation of the college of the king. And if I skip ahead a bit, uh, then sorry. Okay, so if you plug in Q equals log n, you just have to believe me that it's it gives you the same. Uh, approximation factor up to a constant, up to the, whatever this O is hiding. Okay, um, so that's that's the result uh, I want to talk about. And uh, again, I think this is probably a narrower audience than I initially made these slides for, so I'll just go over this next slide a little bit quickly, uh, just so we're on the same page. And if, you know, if something's unclear, you can slow me down, but probably there's no need. So. I just want to say a couple of words about right, the general framework that we're using here 
is uh, like approximation algorithms using some complex relaxation. Um, right, so okay, probably this audience is familiar with this, but we have some optimization program over zero one. So we express it as an integer program. And then we look at the, you know, the optimum according to this definition, and we relax it to a, a continuous linear program, which you know, may move the optimum to you know, something beyond the integer optimum. And then we solve the, let's say, linear program, and we get some optimal solution, and then we apply a rounding algorithm, which is where the magic happens. And that gives us some feasible integer solution, which is, of course, probably suboptimal and the actual opt is somewhere in between. And so right, our method of uh, uh, expressing the or bounding the approximation ratio of the algorithm is just to bound the uh, guarantee of the rounding algorithm. Right? So if the rounding loses at most an alpha uh, factor, right, then that also bounds the ratio between the algorithm and the actual optimum, which is a smaller ratio. Um, okay, so with with this plan in mind, uh, right, so what do we need to do? We need to form formulate some uh, relaxation, we need to design some rounding algorithm, and to prove that this rounding algorithm has some nice property that you know when we round our fractional solution, we get something which is not too much, whose cost is not too much worse. Um, and uh, I should. Just note that, uh, right, as many of you know, you can do something which is a little bit more fancy than just, you know, writing a linear program and then, uh, you know, then solving and then rounding, which is uh, you can, uh, right, the, it doesn't have to, the constraints don't have to be linear. You just have to have some, you, you need a, uh, the, the, or at least in this framework, you need the, the, uh, uh, solution space to be the, the convex um, and uh, right so that may give us conceivably uh, a, a, you know op, uh, a fractional optimum which is closer to the true optimum uh, and in addition to that uh, what we need is the following property uh, which is a separation oracle uh, uh, right, which which means uh, that uh, we have a procedure which, if we are given a solution or a, a candidate fractional solution, which is not feasible, the procedure should be able to identify some linear constraint which does hold for all the feasible solutions, but does not hold for the candidate solution that we're looking at. So this is called a a separating hyperplane, a separation oracle is the algorithm which does this. So just pictorially, right, if we have this feasible region on the left in green and this blue dot, which is a candidate infeasible solution, uh, which, you know, in the context of the ellipsoid algorithm is the sort of the candidate solution that we're thinking about right now, then the procedure or the separation oracle should be able to identify this blue, uh, right, this, the, the, the this, this uh, uh, cons linear constraint defined by this blue region, which completely contains all the feasible solutions, but separates them from this particular infeasible solution. Okay, uh, all right. And then you know, we can run the ellipsoid uh, method and all kinds of nice things happen. Okay, so let uh, me get that. Yes, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, yeah. I'm going to add that question. Sure. Uh, Formulation? Am I yeah. audible? Sorry? Yes, you are. So, in the result slides, like a few slides ago, you had P less uh -huh. than equal to Q. Is that like a technical requirement or is there some? Ah, so, that's that's a great question. I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to that towards the end of the talk. Uh, but it's, let's say it's a requirement of maybe our sort of intuition of, you know, in, in what way this kind of generalizes uh, pair clustering. Uh, but there's kind of a notion, a natural notion when they are equal, which is just, you know, the global optimum, there's a, a natural notion when Q is much larger or log n or infinity, which is this previous notion of fair clustering. So in, the, in that way, this 
at least this parameter regime kind of generalizes that family of problems. Um, but I will get I'll, I will cut back to the other regime uh, a little bit later. So it's, it's a very good question. Uh, okay. Uh, a bit more. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, sort of the mathematical economics literature, like there's a, like there are axiomatic justifications for such objects. But yeah, the, the, the point to yeah. it, however, is there it's uh, for welfare maximization rather than like say distance, i.e. cost minimization. So are there such axioms that these uh, formulations satisfy? I mean, maybe like a more uh, brutal way of asking the question is like, is this just more of a like a formulation that makes sense semantically or is there a like a foundational so, reason why? So there, the, so complexity wise, they're actually pretty different uh, in terms of approximability. So I, I will actually, I will talk about the other regime uh, towards the end of the, the talk. They're actually, they're fairly different problems in terms of you know, the algorithmic tools that you can apply and the, the, the hardness of the problems. So I, I will, I will talk about that a bit. OK, uh, so, uh, any other question? OK, great, thanks. Good. So, uh, all right. so let's get back to the, uh, the PQ fair clustering problem, right? So uh, here's the simplified setting, right? This is the reason I discussed this chart uh, uh, result earlier. Uh, right? They have this kind of reduction, which really simplifies this problem, right? because right, sort of one of the slightly complicated things about these sort of clustering problems is that the there's this dependence of the objective function in this kind of unnatural way on the set of centers that you choose because it's only after you choose right well okay maybe i'll say what the simpler thing is and then i'll say why it's simpler okay so the 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 sort of after you apply this this production in in their uh, in their paper then you get these two disjoint point sets and the the goal is now to choose all points to be centers except for some subset within a within the first set uh, and everyone else will be centers including b and you only pay for the non-centers that you choose in a and moreover uh, uh, you only pay the cost of their distance to b not to other points in a Okay, so you choose this point, you choose these sets in S. This is everyone except for the all the non-centers. Uh, and you, you assign them to the nearest center, but only to the nearest center sort of across the river in B. Uh, if there's a close point in A, you, you forget about it. Uh, okay, and then you have a somewhat cleaner formulation because you can sort of say in advance what the cost will be of uh, not choosing a point to be a center. And it doesn't depend on whether you chose, chose this or that other uh, point to be a center as well. Uh, so you kind of get this objective function a priori, uh, which doesn't depend, uh, right, that the sort of individual costs don't depend on the global structure of the, of the solution, which is nice, which simplifies things somewhat, uh, right? So if we think about it in this framework, then now you could kind of simplify, I don't know if this formula is necessary, what do you think of as simplification, but uh, right, but a group cost uh, is now basically, right, every point in A, if you choose it to be a non-center, it has a fixed cost that it will incur. It's its distance to this, you know, the, the whatever its distance is to its closest point in B, no matter what you choose for, you know, the rest of the solution. And so it's just the, uh, the group cost is just the P norm of this uh, vector of distances uh, uh, constrained to the non-centers in the group. Okay, um, and then as we did before, you aggregate these costs with the Q norm. Okay. Um, How much will there be? 
so this is this this is something that arises from this uh, algorithm of Charaka Vital. They have this kind of not exactly a pre-processing step, but sort of a first step, which sort of creates a, a new instance. They do kind of a preliminary clustering step, and then they kind of ignore all the points which have already been clustered or have already been assigned to some center, and they say, okay, this new instance, this is what we want to cluster. And anyone who you know, is kind of being ignored, can be reassigned, you know, afterwards according to their reduction. Um, but you have to sort of run this first step of their algorithm to get this to get this new instance. Um, so, uh, okay, All right. so that's this, uh, so that's the cost now. Um, and that also makes it somewhat simpler to write sort of a convex uh, programming relaxation. So, uh, all right, so it looks like this. So so let's think of like a zero one solution. So in a zero one solution, we'll, we'll have these X variables, which represent uh, uh, an indicator for only an A. OK, I should say it's only points in A. So, uh, so here, you sort of, right, we want to pay for the points that incur a cost. So that means the non-centers. Okay, so one means it's a non-center, it's a point in S. Uh, and then, okay, these are not zero one, these are the cost variables. Uh, but even in a zero one solution, these are not zero one uh, variables. They represent the group cost, but for convenience, it's the group cost raised to the Q because it's a little easier to formulate than just the Q norm, uh, okay? So here's this convex program. I'll, I'll go over it sort of line by line so you don't have to stare at it all at once. So first the objective function, right? So this is the aggregate cost. This is exactly what we said before. It's of so ZI represents the group cost raised to the Q. Then this expression is the Q norm of the vector of group costs, okay? Uh, right, and now the first constraint of basically is just an expression for the what, what we think of as the group cost raised to the Q. Uh, so if you look at the, or you just look at the actual expression, if you know, XJs are uh, the indicators for, you know, which points we take, that, that this is exactly that expression. And then uh, the box constraints as usual, and then we have this size constraint. So we have some objective. If we want to choose a certain number of points, in A to be non-centers again, according to this, you know, according to what whatever the uh, reduction of Charaka tells us. Okay, so this is this. Uh, so this is the convex uh, relaxation, and um, so uh, yeah. Um, so note that this uh, right this first constraint is a a. Uh, convex constraint for Q greater or equal to P. That's also another way in which this is different from the other regime, because here this gives a convex constraint and, and the other regime, this is not convex, so you have to do something else. Uh, and the objective function is not convex, but it doesn't matter because it's just a, a monotone function of a linear constraint. So it's exactly, it's just this equivalent to minimizing this linear constraint. Um, okay, so that's the relaxation any questions about that um okay so uh all right so where are we so we have our convex relaxation and now we need to round um and we, we do really the simplest possible rounding or maybe the next simplest after that which is randomized round right you just you have these points in a the linear or convex program suggests, you know, some fractional value xj for every point, which is how much confidence it has in, you know, at the thinking that j should belong to the solution. So we just independently add j to the solution with exactly that probability. This is this classical randomized random. Okay. Um, so, so we're just uh, whizzing through this. So that was very fast. Good. Uh, so, okay, so how do we prove something about 
this uh, this rounding. Okay, so again we have this relaxation, and we're doing randomized rounding. Just add j with probability x j according to the relaxation. So here's the analysis, um, and I should warn you, um, I, I'm going to mislead you here at some point, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you about it later, so I'm not completely dishonest. Uh, OK, so first of all, the, this, let's analyze the size of the solution. This is pretty straightforward, like in every round, randomized rounding algorithm, right? So the expectation of the solution size is you have to use linearity of expectation, and you get the summation over these probabilities. We chose them to be, you know, uh, as in the convex program. So you know, the expectation is exactly what the convex program suggests. It's the sum. Uh, so the, and and furthermore, I should say, uh, more importantly, uh, assuming that uh, the problem is interesting and and you know, uh, and you have a, a large uh, number of points that you need to add to the solution, then Chernoff implies that in fact the solution says will be roughly what we need and and that that really is okay. So this is not this is not where I'm going to you. Uh, okay. So now let's uh, all right. So the solution size is okay. And now what about the group costs? Right? We want them to be kind of similar to the value as associated with group costs in the convex program. Uh, okay, so here's the group cost over here, red. Um, right, so what is the expectation of this group cost? Uh, right, so uh, so again, we use uh, linearity of uh, expectation, and uh, if the value is large, then, you know, Chernoff says that um, Right, that this, it really will be concentrated around the expectation. Um, and we have, uh, right, and so, so this is, right, so the expectation will be roughly this, and, and convene, right, so this, okay, so that's our cost, and conveniently, uh, uh, right, like, let me just do the whole thing, right? So what is the aggregate cost now, if, if these are the individual group costs? So here's the objective, uh, right? So again, we apply the Q norm to this vector of group costs. Um, and uh, right, because these group costs are kind of what the convex program said, then you get kind of what the convex program said. And uh, right, and then this constraint for the group cost variable says that this is bounded by our objective function, uh, right? So that looks, I think, pretty convincing, um, right? So that's like the, the, the fractional optimum. Um, so it's as if I just showed you that we have an exact algorithm for this NP-hard problem. So that's probably unlikely. Um, so now you know that I, I definitely lied to you. So let's see where. Um, Okay, so this this was not a lie, right? The linearity of expectation it really is linearity of expectation, but this is this is not true. Okay. So Chernoff assumes that we have uh, well, I mean it, it doesn't assume anything, but it's just not useful if we don't have a, a large expectation, right? If this is describing a low probability event, if we have many Bernoulli variables, but you know it's only with low probability that any of them uh, will be one, then Chernoff doesn't apply, right? So, so this is not true. Um, and not only is the analysis not true, the rounding, the rounding is just going to fail. So you can think of a, a very simple, uh, you know, the simplest possible case, you think of a uniform metric uh, and uh, Right, so um, if if these uh, so so this um, right so so the group uh, right what we're associating with the group cost is is now something that's going to be zero with very high probability, um, and then you're not going to have concentration. Right? So actually, if you if this actually if this sum of Bernoulli variables is epsilon 
then, okay, don't do the calculation. You can do this, just believe me that the check it's correct, okay? But then she, you can do this offline. And, okay, so the objective function, you know, will be, you know, whatever you get from applying the Q norm to this. But uh, on the other hand, if you look at group costs, then, you know, every group cost will be one or at least one with some at least order epsilon probability. Um, and so if an epsilon fraction of groups have this large cost uh, after the rounding, then uh, the clustering will have this cost, right? Uh, it's the, sort of the number of, uh, at least this cost. Uh, and, uh, and so if you sort of look at the, you know, what you get from the rounding and what the objective function thinks you should have, then you have this gap of one over epsilon to this thing. And there's no bound on epsilon, right? There's no reason why you, I mean, epsilon could be anything, right? So you have like an arbitrarily bad uh, integrality gap, um, or at least rounding gap, but really it's kind of a useless uh, relaxation as, as it's stated. So we have to somehow fix this. Uh, and so we fix this by kind of fo focusing on what it is that is doing poorly here. And the thing that is doing poorly is that uh, the rounding is not well, the combination of the, the convex program of the rounding is not handling this case well, where you have a lot of groups with with uh, you know very small value, uh, because we don't have concentration around the expectation, right? So this uh, this constraint here, this is a useful constraint if actually you know this is tight in the rounding, right? If actually this is uh, right, if 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 this is a regime where Chernoff applies. Um, otherwise, we're better off using this, this other uh, constraint, which uh, is, you just believe me. Uh, yeah, you don't have to believe me. It's, it's actually, it's a simple proof. It's just, uh, it just follows from the one norm is greater or equal to the Q over P norm when, when Q is greater or equal to P. Um, so, okay, so this is, right, so this bound also holds, and then we can use this bound to write a new constraint. So here's another lower bound on the uh, cost variable, um, which I say, it, it, this is actually a stronger constraint exactly in this regime where the sum of x's for this group is very small. Uh, okay, so now if we look at the rounding again, then right in this can these two extreme scenarios, uh, right? The first one where, you know, the, 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 that false proof we said, oh, you know, all these groups are going to have high concentration, everything is okay. So in that regime, you know, everything works as before. And if all, none of the groups have high concentration, they all have uh, very small values, then, uh, or, or, you know, the, this, this kind of bad regime that I just discussed, then this other constraint, uh, uh, you know, if you you could use this to to sort of easily show that the that you know that you get a good rounding. Um, okay, but then what you know in general you could have some mix and some things that are in between and so on. So you know who, who says that this this should be enough? Um, so I can tell you it's uh, it's this guy. Uh, uh, Rafał Latawa uh, says that it's enough. He's a Polish probabilist, uh, and he has uh, in his book uh, this nice inequality uh, about uh, the sort of p-norm or the q-norm of of, uh, of independent random variables. And uh, if you apply this inequality to our setting, then basically, uh, right, so you get this expression um, and this is exactly what we needed right so the, the sort of the bound on the left uh, is what we need to deal with sort of the high concentration regime and the bound on the right uh, deals with this low probability regime um, and these exactly match the nice uh, these exactly match the right the, the, the nice constraints that we have in our convex program um, so, uh, okay, um, so, oh, wait, I should say, right, 
So in addition to that, there's also this first factor here, this O of Q or whatever to the Q over P. Um, so right, if we didn't have that, then this would be like a constant factor approximation. Uh, right? We could use this with the sort of same analysis, it would give you a constant, but you can't because it's not true. So you need this additional factor. And then this additional factor, that is that ex is exactly our approximation ratio. Okay. So at least on the face of it, right, it seems like this proves uh, alpha approximation for that expression, right? That, that coefficient that we saw on the, on the last slide. Um, so, but of course, if it did, then I wouldn't be asking whether it proves it. So, of course, it's not, not enough. Okay, so, yeah. So the reason that that's not quite enough is that right, there's this reduction that I mentioned before, Charikarita, that gives you this new instance. Um, that works nicely for, you know, fair clustering and for global optimal, but in this PQ, uh, PQ fair clustering, uh, this doesn't work. This reduction is not black box with respect to our convex program and our algorithm. So we need to open the black box. Um, so if I can say maybe just a couple of words uh, about this reduction, um, so what it does is it right it has this kind of this preliminary clustering, uh, right? So think of these white points that later disappear, and they get mapped to one of the to sort of a would be center or a sort of kind of first round center that survives the reduction, and then we kind of ignore them. But we ignore them because what happens after the reduction is that if in the reduction or if in this new or our, if our algorithm takes this new instance and takes their center away, right, takes this point J and assigns it to some other center, and now they lose their center, then they have to be, they have to kind of follow this point and, and get reassigned to some center that survives the algorithm. Um, so, so uh, one way you might think about it, and I, I don't want to kind of you know write the whole thing, but you could kind of imagine that, okay, so you have these like red clusters, and you can sort of make a similar argument to you know what we argued about before, but with respect to clusters as well, and not just with respect to individual points. Um, but even that is, is kind of tricky. And the reason it's tricky is because Right, these clusters are not part of the input. These clusters uh, arise as a product of the algorithm uh, applied to the uh, input, right? And the algorithm uh, depends on the convex program. So you have kind of a circular dependence, right? You can't have Right, the, the convex program which foresees what the algorithm based on the convex program will do and then uses that in order to <laughs> something has to come first. So right, we can't know a priori what these clusters will be. Um, so that <laughs> brings me to the final idea uh, for this algorithm, which is in a sense the add constraints for all possible clusters. So, what does that mean here? Uh, of course, you can't do all possible clusterings. It's an exponential number of them. But what we basically do is, is like a rounding separation oracle. So we use the reduction uh, as a separation oracle in itself. We apply it, and then we need certain constraints to hold with respect to the clusters that we get from this first step, uh, right? And if uh, if we get uh, if the uh, solution doesn't uh, respect this, uh, if the solution uh, uh, doesn't satisfy the constraints with respect to this clustering, <coughs> then we stop our rounding, or we're just going to throw it away, and then we we uh, use this to take another step in the ellipsoid method with this new. Uh, violated constraint that we discovered. And the crucial observation is that we actually, we don't need 
the constraints to hold for every possible clustering. It's enough that they hold for whatever clustering we got from this first step of the algorithm. OK, uh, so. Uh, right, so we kind of, you know, by the you know, logic of the ellipsoid method, at some point, you know, you will no longer have addition. It's impossible that you will have additional uh, constraints, uh, infeasible constraints to add. And at that point, uh, you're at least guaranteed that uh, this uh, uh, that, that, that you will that it will um, satisfy the constraints that we need for the clustering uh, that we've arrived at. OK. Um, and the new constraints uh, are, you know, it's e they're easy. They're just exactly the constraints we had before, just applied to clusters. It's the first thing you would think of. OK, so maybe it's like the sixth or seventh thing you would think of. But anyway, don't think about it too hard because we already did and it works. It's OK. Uh, OK. So now I want to sort of finally uh, you know, get back to the question uh, that we had earlier about uh, uh, the, this regime, right? So, but, <clears throat> so remember we had sort of, I said at one extreme we had Q equals P and at the other extreme we had Q equals infinity, but Q is always at least P when we're kind of uh, going between uh, or interpolating between these two extremes. And of course, it's a great question. What about the other case, right? P could be equal to Q. It's, it's an interesting question, right? So, but can, what does it mean, right? So if we have, at one end we have fairness, at the other hand we have global cost, and then we go beyond that, then is that unfairness? It's, it's un, um, but it actually, it does have some uh, motivations. So you know, in addition to what was already mentioned, it, it's also a natural mathematical problem. It does generalize the problem to all values of P and Q, and it generalizes other uh, important problems. Um, so one problem that it generalizes is this problem called min S union, um, which is, uh, it's very similar to densest K subgraph, uh, which I know a number of you are very interested in. Um, so this min S union problem is like the hypergraph uh, minimization version of that. So uh, so we're given M sets uh, that cover some universe and uh, or yeah, and then uh, we have some target number of uh, sets that we want to choose. And the goal is to minimize the union of these sets. OK, so it's a pretty straightforward uh, problem. So let me try to explain. I know it's kind of late in the talk, uh, but let me say just in a few words how this is related to this fair clustering idea, it turns out that this is exactly infinity one fair clustering. If you just look at the definition, I'll, I'll kind of run through this a little bit quickly because I'm a little bit low on time, uh, but this is this is pretty easy to see sort of offline, probably more so than at, towards the end of a talk. Uh, but basically, uh, if you look at the definition, right, if you set the parameters P and Q to infinity and one, um then a uh, group cost uh is basically uh right it's going to be zero if the group intersects the point of the set of non-centers and one sorry zero if it doesn't intersect the group of non-centers and one if it does um and if you just kind of reverse the roles and now you you say okay what are the sets now the sets are like the um, right in our, in our reduction, the sets are going to be the uh, the sets of points. Um, sorry, the sets of groups containing a given point. Um, then it turns out that the right you just it's you can do it offline easily. So the the, the the optimum is, uh, or the objective is exactly the cardinality of the union. So this this is the min, min s union problem, um, up to adding some distances and costs and things. Um, okay, so what do we know about this problem? There's a mm, sort of enter the one fourth plus epsilon approximation. It's actually a little bit <coughs> problematic, but it's it it there is that approximation at least when the set sizes are bounded or at least subpolynomial. 
and then more generally there is this pretty close approximation um, and so right it, it can't be right either we improve that or we can't do any better so because this is a you know, that, that's a special case of this problem. And there also there's this dense versus random conjecture, which implies you can't do better than that. Um, so that's kind of right. It, it does seem like it's right. It, it, this is a, a, a qualitatively different problem. It's probably pro polynomially hard. Uh, I mean, hard to get it better than some polynomial approximation, as opposed to that other regime, which is like sub logarithmic, even constant in some regimes. Um, OK. and. I should say the same conjecture also implies a, a similar hardness for PQ fair clustering when P is greater than Q. Um, but uh, that, you know, that's a pretty involved algorithm. It uses this log density framework. Uh, you have to guess a number of uh, constant, uh, a constant number of elements. And in the, and in, if you want to make this convex programming, like you know, in, in, you know, some other papers, then you need hierarchies okay so it's actually not not these specific hierarchies but you need like hierarchies of convex relaxations uh which allow us to kind of do this conditioning of sort of, quote unquote guessing uh, that something is in the solution um but the problem is the thing that we're guessing here is not zero one right these hierarchies work when you're when they're based on a zero one problem and here we have these costs they could just be arbitrary real numbers. So it's not really right. You, there isn't really a natural way to sort of condition on, on that. Um, so that being just like uh, one or two words say that. Uh, um, OK, so let me say what we have the, or what we published in, in the recent soda was this k to the one half times this uh, expression rather than this lower bound of one fourth. Uh, there were no hierarchies, there was no conditioning. Um, and uh, I guess we could probably improve that half to two sevens. Uh, pr probably we can bring it down to where min s union is, but then we got sidetracked and we should get back to that. Um, but I should say, so, you know, the, the, so we do some kind of combinatorialization so that we're not stuck trying to condition on something that's not even zero one in the zero one case. Um, and then some non-standard uh, second level uh, relaxation. And, uh, and then there's some you know, very simpler constraints, even simpler than the ones that I showed before. Right? So of course, it's better not show this for too long. OK, so this is the actual end of the talk. And I'd be very happy to take any questions if you have some. question about the reduction, Charika et al. reduction. So there, yeah. does the partition A always have uh, points from all the groups? Uh, so the, the, I mean, the reduction is, uh, the reduction is, uh, is sort of uh, um, oblivious to the groups. Uh, it's really, a, a, it only looks at the sort of the metric. So it's it's the same, right? So their reduction was for uh, k median, uh, and it really did, it doesn't really care about any other objective or group structure or anything. Okay. Uh, hey, Eden. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, first question is, uh, can you uh, tell us, uh, so that the ellipsoid algorithm works for the convex program, uh, you mentioned a creating uh, oracle. Uh, in this case, uh, what would uh, such an oracle do or uh, what would it mean? Or, yeah, uh, uh -huh, sure. So we have, uh, okay, let me see. So, Okay, here we go. Okay, so here's this, uh, right? This is kind of this simple version of the convex program with, with no clusters. 
Maybe we want like a cluster version of this uh, to apply to the to apply to the, uh, the the sort of the instance after the reduction, right? And then these it sort of those constraints become these constraints when you sort of replace the points with clusters. It's probably not very easy to see, but if you think about it for long enough, that's this, this is kind of the moral equivalent of those sim simpler constraints in the clustered world uh, or in the kind of reduction world. Um, so basically you get these, right, these VLs, these represent like the first step of the Charakarat al algorithm. Um, and then, uh, so you, you have these, right, you, you have, you have these, you know what these clusters are, and you only need these constraints to hold for this specific kind of first round of clustering. Uh, so you just, you just check these, you check these directly, and, uh, um, and if they don't hold, then you have a violated constraint. Uh, and then you you use that for the to continue the um, ellipsoid algorithm. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the other question I had was uh, mm -hmm. if if you can go back to the slide where uh, you showed uh, the approximation factor alpha. Uh, why for, why is for for the first for which regime the first regime? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my question was, why is it not constant factor again? Like uh, maybe uh, I missed. So I mean, why is it? Uh, so it is. It is so a it constant is factor. If, yeah. It, so yes, it is. Is if uh, where is it? Where is here? We go. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, for yeah. when q when p and q are constant, it is a constant. But it's a function of p p and q. So right. So one sort of. Right, one extreme case, uh, so to speak, is like the p fair clustering, which is sort of equivalent to the case of q equals log n. And when q equals log n, then this is no longer a constant, and actually can't be a constant because we know that, you know, this approximation, which you know matches the, the, the uh, you know, the specific approximation for p, p fair clustering is optimal unless NP has you know, some exponential time algorithms. So, so given PQ, it's a constant time. Uh, sorry, a constant factor approximation. For Yes, for bounded P and Q, it's a constant factor approximation. So it does generalize sort of all the, you know, uh, I mean, I guess that probably was known that, you know, if you kind of generalize K median and K centers and so on for, for like general LP metrics that we have a constant approximation, but this also sort of generalizes it even a little bit more uh, for the you know different uh, measures. Uh. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, so I have one hi. question about this. Yeah. Uh, so you said that it's the ratio is tied when uh, I guess so in the regime where Q is greater than P, the ratio is tied when Q uh, goes to infinity, right? Yes. Yeah, that's but right. what about when, let's say, uh, Q is slightly lesser and so on? Sorry, when Q is what? Q, Q is, let, let's say, not, not log n, it's little of log n, for, for example. Oh, like square root log n or something. Yeah, yeah some, something like that. Yeah, is I don't know. It's a good question. I guess. Mm, so I guess in that case, you might want to look at this uh, uh, this Bhattacharya uh, et al. paper with the hardness. Uh, so where is it? Uh, yeah. So right. So there's this. Uh, right. So so there's. For for q, let's say q equals log n, there's this matching uh, hardness lower bound. Uh, so uh, I have to confess I don't really know that result well. Um, so you, you probably want to look at that and 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 see if uh, you know if there's a you could sort of apply that to get uh, a matching lower bound or if there's maybe still some some gap there. Yeah. Uh, 
That's a good question. Okay, thanks. So is the MB21 algorithm similar to this? For the case um, of the QS infinity? Um, so, well, some some things are similar and some things are not. So, sort of this idea of, uh, of the separation oracle, uh, is, this is new. Uh, sort of initially we had some extension of that, but it it sort of it was kind of based on that algorithm, but it had this very strange behavior where it was kind of like it was the, the right expression. At, at the two extremes, and then in between it kind of shot up to some polynomial approximation, which clearly it, it didn't need to. Uh, and then when we sort of, uh, sort of when we, when we kind of changed how we thought about the, right, the convex program and, and, and the rounding, then uh, that's, um, that's, so that's, I think that that's the, the main difference uh, between the two algorithms. There was some notion there for like, uh, you know, because if you just do the, like what I said at the beginning, you really get not, nothing at all. So, so there was some notion there of, you know, some special constraints in order to, you know, improve the rounding, but they, they didn't, they weren't quite the right constraints. Uh, so this is kind of, I mean, they were fine. Obviously for that regime, they gave an optimal map, op optimal algorithm, uh, but uh, for this more general case, they, they weren't, they weren't sufficient. Uh, one more question about the conjecture you referred to. Can, can, can you oh, briefly sure. talk about that? Yeah, uh, yeah. The P, P greater than Q regime. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, right. So in this, this is like, uh, this is kind of like this, this conjecture for densest case subgraph where you have like, uh, you know that if you have like an n vertex graph with degree say n to the alpha and it contains or a random right like a Erdős-Rényi graph with like expected degree n to the alpha uh, then right you could uh, plant a subgraph of size k with degree that's sufficiently small or, you know, noticeably smaller than k to the alpha. And in some parameter regimes, the, the conjecture says that you wouldn't be able to distinguish between the planted and non-planted case. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the, it's kind of like a uh, planted clique, but with a, a dense subgraph instead of a, an actual clique uh, and, and a different uh, the graph uh, density. Uh, um, so this is like the, the hypergraph sort of extension of that. If you think of like, think of a hypergraph with like uh, uh, arity, which is like some very large constant or like, you know, log log n or something, something not polynomial, but sufficiently large. Um, so if you kind of extend the logic from densest case subgraph to hypergraphs, then this is sort of the, this is where that intuition would suggest that the gap would be. And this is also matched by like uh, Shirelli Adams integrality gaps up to some super constant number of rounds. Uh, so there's at least some reason to think that, uh, that this is maybe uh, a lower bound or it's a lower bound, but you know, maybe it's the right lower bound. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, any other questions? Okay, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks so much, Vidan. Okay, thank you very much. And, you know, if anyone wants to talk offline, always shoot me an email. I'm happy, happy to do it. Thank you. Uh, let me stop the recording.